So we begin chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, and Paul's been talking about rights and knowledge. He's been talking about the weak. He's been talking about the danger of involving yourself in causing someone to fall from the faith. And the point Paul has been making is that even though you have rights, you need to give them up if your exercising your rights is going to cause someone else to stumble from the faith. Now, this isn't about the tyranny of the weak and their being offended by something that your Christian freedom allows you to do. Uh, in one sense, if people are offended, so what? Uh, we, uh, Paul says we can't be delivered back into slavery. But if it's going to cause someone to actually fall from the faith, then that's a different story. Now, usually the tyrannical Christian isn't in danger of stumbling from the faith. He just wants to control your behavior. And that's where our Christian freedom needs to trump their so-called weakness. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verses 1 and 2. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my, my apostleship in the Lord. Chapter 8, uh, Paul was talking about food, eating food, being sacrificed to idols. And he's going to conclude his comments about this uh, in chapter 10. So in one sense, it kind of seems like chapter 9, Paul's allowed himself to get off topic again when he starts talking about um, salary and benefits packages. Um, but not really. Um, what he's doing is he's switching the focus from the Corinthians to himself. And his point is, he too is free, just like the enlightened Corinthians are claiming to be. He is free to eat and to drink and to be married and to expect support from the congregation. And even more because he's an apostle. He's one who has seen the risen Jesus, um, which is more than most of the Corinthians could claim. He has the knowledge and the authority of an apostle and the Corinthian congregation is proof of his apostleship. They are his handiwork. In other words, if he hadn't come to them, they wouldn't be in existence. Then Paul uh, gives four proofs for uh, uh, the apostle's right to support. And that's uh, verses 3 through 14. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as others, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of its milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure everything or anything rather than to put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at, an, at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Okay. Now, Paul as an apostle has every right to be, or to expect to be supported financially in his work. In fact, he has every right to demand it. Um, and to support his argument, he uses four examples. He uses the example of a soldier, a grape grower or a, a vineyard owner. He uses the example of a, a shepherd. And then he comes up with an example from the word of God itself. 
Um, and they're all examples that confirm that he has a right to receive a wage as compensation for his work as an apostle. Now, as an aside, why is Paul doing this? Well, the Corinthians were saying, we have a right to eat food dedicated to idols, and those who are offended by it should just get over it. And Paul's telling them, yes, you have that right. But you don't always need to demand your rights, especially if it's going to harm the spiritual life of someone or if it's going to get in the way of proclaiming the gospel. And to illustrate this, Paul uses his right to financial support. And like us, uh, whenever there's talk of money, uh, everybody's ears perk up and everybody starts paying attention. Paul says he has the right to demand support, but for the sake of the gospel, um, because it might have deterred people from the faith, he has chosen not to demand his rights. Now, of course, Paul knows what the Corinthians are thinking, or at least some of them. Some of them were thinking that Paul uh, refused to take compensation because he knew that he didn't have a right to it. He knew that he wasn't really an apostle, and so it would be wrong to demand an apostle's wage. But he is an apostle. That's something he has already pointed out. And so Paul argues that he and Barnabas have every right to expect financial support. He has a right to eat and to drink, which uh, might also be a reference to the idol food that was talked about er uh, earlier. Uh, he has a right to marry a Christian woman, just like the other apostles did, like Jesus' brothers and Peter. Uh, they had married wives, and they'd taken their wives along with them on journeys uh, to proclaim the gospel. Paul, arg Paul argues that he and Barnabas had these same rights. But when it came to the right of compensation, they purposely refused to exercise their right, and instead they supported themselves. Um, look at verse 7. Um, Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting any or getting some of the milk? Paul asks these three questions that are kind of related to everyday life. He uses the example of a soldier and a grape grower, a shepherd. Um, and it's just obvious that the laborer expects to receive compensation for his efforts. Now, it's kind of interesting, just as an aside, um, that uh, Scripture often pictures God's people as an army or as a vineyard or as a flock. So Paul isn't just picking three examples out of a hat. These, each of these have to do with the church. Um, and to continue, Paul uses references then from the Old Testament, uh, his, his fourth argument, as to why he has a right to be paid. And the point is, he's not just giving his opinion on the subject. This isn't just Paul's idea. He has the Old Testament behind him as well. And Paul quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. He says, you shall not muzzle the ox uh, while it is threshing the grain. That's from Deuteronomy. Now, the context of that verse is the fair treatment of all human beings, uh, especially those who are in need. Uh, and the principle that God is laying down is that it's only fair that all workers be paid for their services. And Paul takes that, and in verse 10, he insists that Paul is speaking of those who work full-time in spreading the gospel, too. Those who work, the plowman, the thresher, anyone who works, should be confident. In other words, they work in hopes that their labors will be compensated for. Um, that's what you do. You, you work all month in the hope that at the end of the month, your employer will give you a paycheck. And so Paul and others who have, have sown spiritual things can rightfully expect some compensation. Others have exercised this right, he says. Uh, it's just that Paul hasn't. As I mentioned earlier, part of the reason for that is um, that uh, uh, the people may have felt that he wasn't an, uh, an apostle, and he, and he answers that he is an apostle. Um, and uh, he doesn't demand his right um, because 
He wants nothing to get in the way of spreading the gospel. In his opinion, um, if he would take a, a salary for, for his work, um, there might be a, a cut across the path that would block the progress of, of preaching the gospel, at least in Paul's case. And so Paul asks the Corinthian congregation not to trip up the weak, and he dem that's what he's done, and he demonstrates uh, what he's saying by putting his, his money where his mouth is. He says, I won't demand compensation for the sake of hindering the weak uh, uh, and keeping the gospel from their midst. And so that's why Paul doesn't demand his rights. His main concern is spreading the gospel, and he wants nothing to hinder that. Um, what he preached was free salvation, and he made sure that they understood that by preaching for free. Um, uh, this might also be a reason why he doesn't demand compensation. You remember uh, a while back we talked about the second sophistic movement teachers. I liken them to the Stephen Colbert and the, the John Stewart types uh, who would speak and they would entertain for money. Um, what Paul was doing, preaching for free, was very different from these traveling philosophers who would only teach if they would get paid and they'd charge for their services. Okay, So he's setting himself apart from them. And finally, then, of course, Paul appeals to Scripture, and he uses the example of the priests and the Levites. Um, they were both, both of those groups were compensated for their work with meat and grain and tithes. Uh, it's talked about in Numbers uh, chapter 18. It's also talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let me just read that one. Um, the Levitical priests, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. And this shall be the priests due from the people. From those offering a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. So the priests get tripe. Yum. And then, finally, finally, um, the final piece of evidence that Paul presents is a command from the Lord Jesus himself. And maybe he brings this up because people might have been saying, why compensate any of the apostles? Um, and uh, Jesus' principle uh, is, as he says, uh, those who preach the gospel are to live by the gospel. When Jesus sent the 72 out, he told them the laborer is worthy of his wages. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 7. And since Jesus said this to the 72 and not just to the 12, it has a broader meaning then than just the apostles. All right? Okay, verse uh, 15 through 18. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. All right. So having established the principle that, every, that, that he has a right and every right to be compensated, Paul returns to the point that he began to make in, in verse 12, uh, that we did not take advantage of this right. For Paul, preaching the gospel was of the greatest importance. Now, in the Greek, this is a, a very passionate grammatical construction. 
um, uh, it, it's a construction in which uh, the sentence, he, he starts off this sentence and he deliberately breaks it off and, and, it, and it's unfinished and the end, uh, the end of that sentence is, is just kind of supposed to be added on by your imagination. It's kind of like when we say, I was so angry I could just... <sighs> and, and your imagination kind of finishes that sentence. Paul says, I would rather die than... than, than well, no one shall invalidate my ground for glorying, is what he says. Um, so you can imagine Paul dictating this letter, and, and he gets very, very emotionally charged. He'd say, I'd just rather die than... And he realizes kind of midstream that he's got to keep to the subject, and so he stops mid-sentence. And he moves on. Um, he didn't want to take compensation for the gospel so that nothing would hinder the gospel. Um, any other reasons? Well, you can imagine some. Uh, in Corinth, the financial compensation would have come from the strong, from the rich. And Paul's fear was that would make him their client and them his patrons. And that would be very similar to what was going on with the Second Sophistic Movement teachers. And of course, that would require favors, and they might try to demand favored terms when it comes to what Paul might say about their position in the church, or their relation with the weak, or their ordering and status. And, and that would make Paul hostage to these kind of pastoral pressures. And he just didn't want to deal with any of that. He left that kind of thing to the parish pastors. Um, he didn't want to owe them anything. Um, he had another burden, he said, another necessity laid upon him. Um, he was overwhelmed by the generosity of God's grace for his salvation and for calling him to be, of all things, an apostle. And he, he personally had this longing to, if you will, give God some voluntary thank offering, um, but thanks can't be, uh, his, his thanks can't be him doing his apostolic labor. It can't be in just preaching the gospel, um, that he's giving back to God by preaching the gospel. He's compelled to do that. This was his commission. So in his own heart, Paul can't glory, and I mean that in a positive sense, he can't glory in his commission. Um, but what he can do is he can live by the labor of his own hands, and the, that allows him one point of kind of a, a Christ-like giving in which he can boast in a positive way. His own labor permits him to proclaim the gospel for free. Um, as a gospel preacher, Paul felt compelled to preach the good news. He said, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. You see, Paul knew that he was in great debt to God. Um, and there's a couple of ways of incurring this kind of debt, um, or any debt in general. Um, one way is when you borrow something from someone and you have to pay them back. You incur a debt and you need to pay it back. Um, another way to incur debt is when somebody entrusts you with something and then asks you to hand it on to someone else. And until you actually hand it over to the person uh, that you're supposed to, you stand indebted to the person for whom it is uh, intended. And Paul's debt was kind of like this second kind. He had been entrusted with something that was very precious. He'd been entrusted with the gospel. And the Lord charged him with passing it on to others. And until he passed it on to others... He was in debt. If he didn't preach the gospel, if he failed to pass it on, he said the woe was on him. He had a burden of preaching the gospel. Jeremiah talks the same way. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9 says, If I then, if I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. So there are a couple of ways to, to incur a debt, and there are a couple of ways to carry out the task.
Uh, Paul says one way is as a free person, and the other way is uh, as an involuntary conscript. You've been drafted. You have no choice in it at all. If you're free and you do the work voluntarily, you're entitled to a reward. And by reward, I, I don't mean some sort of external payment. It's kind of this internal reward, kind of like the feeling that you get when you give a gift to someone. It's the reward, uh, the reward that a teacher feels when, when his or her student comes up and, and gives them a hug, if that's even legal today, or, or a note uh, of thanks or a gift. Jesus says it this way, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, because an inner reward comes with it. If you do it involuntarily, then you're not entitled to that reward. You, you don't get that joy. And Paul had the choice. He could carry out his task voluntarily or involuntarily. And he chose to do it voluntarily. And he found great satisfaction in presenting the gospel free of charge. That was sufficient reward for him. Um, he's obviously, like he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he's not just another religious peddler, but he's a man of sincerity. All right, let's take a look at uh, 19 through 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. So, in the first 18 verses, we've heard Paul say to the strong, voluntarily forego your rights. And here Paul says, or he adds, stand with them. Forgo your rights and stand with those who have not yet heard the gospel. And the reason he gives is to win as many people as possible to the gospel, even if that means you have to give up certain rights. And to win as many as possible, Paul adapted his mission strategy according to the different kinds of people that he runs into. And he gives four different examples, four different groups of people that he comes into contact with. He comes into contact with Jews, with those who are under the law, those who are without the laws, and the weak, he says. Um, and in order to stand in solidarity with all of these outsiders, in order to show them love and respect and care, Paul says, I have become, I, I, to them, uh, all I have become, every, I have become everything in turn to bring some to salvation. All right. Uh, so that's the nature of the gospel, and Paul seeks to live it out. Um, but it's not easy, and it demands a costly effort and sacrifice. And so later, Paul draws this analogy. We're going to see this. We'll see it at the very end of, of today. Uh, the disciplined train runner who makes sacrifices and, and shares hardship for the sake of, of the goal of the, of, of the wreath, of, of winning the race. And so let's take a look at these different groups of people that Paul runs into. Um, Paul was called uh, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But he felt obligated to first reach out to the Jews. Um, the Jews were God's chosen people. Uh, with their background, they should have been the easiest ones to reach. They should have been able to, to see that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of Israel's ancient hopes. Um, 
The Jews were the natural branches who had been cutting themselves off, and Paul's desire was to graft them back in again. And so Paul regularly comes into contact with the Jews, and he always begins his mission work in, in all the cities that he goes to. He begins his mission work in the synagogues, always appealing to the Jew first, and to win the Jews, Paul had to become as a Jew, and he would do nothing that would cause offense. Um, the second group of people that Paul runs into are those under law. Now, this group includes not only the Jews, but the Gentile God-fearers. Um, the God-fearers were people who were drawn to and accepted much of uh, Jewish law. And even though Paul was free from the law, he humbly identified himself with these people in order to win them to the gospel. The third group are those who are outside the law. Um, these were Gentile converts. Um, now, this group was outside the law, but that doesn't mean that they were lawless people. It means that they weren't Jews. Um, all people have God's law, natural law. It's written in our hearts. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 2. And so by saying that he too didn't live under the law, Paul was saying that his main driving force in life was not the law, but the gospel. It's not that he doesn't care about the law, but what motivates him is gospel, not law. And then the fourth group he talks about are the weak. And uh, the weak, that might have a, a twofold aspect to it. These people might have been the weak ones. in, in uh, They were the ones who were easily swayed by other people, kind of weak in mind. Or they might have been the economically weak ones. They might have been the poor ones. Um, most of the congregation there in Corinth were not well educated. They weren't the influential ones. They weren't of noble birth. Paul talked about that in, in the first chapter. And Paul accommodates himself to them by not taking their hard-earned money uh, for his services. But what Paul's doing here is he's showing flexibility, he's showing adaptability, he's so flexible that he can enter into these very different worlds of, of slave, of free, of Jew, of Greek, and he can do so confidently. Now, all this doesn't mean that Paul's being inconsistent. Um, it's all in his strategy to bring some to salvation in order that he might by all means save some, he says. Um, it's the same kind of thing that Jesus did in his ministry. Jesus entered into all different kinds of situations, and he used all different uh, methods of communication. Sometimes he spoke in parables. Jesus teaches using wisdom sayings. He eats and drinks with sinners and tax collectors. He rejoices with those who rejoice. He weeps with those who weep, all in order to proclaim the gospel in order to save the lost. Um, and so does Paul. He was committed to use whatever method he needed to to reach different groups of people that he came into contact with. He doesn't do it to please himself. He doesn't do it because he's wishy-washy. He doesn't do it without great thought. Uh, and neither does he do it compromising the message. And that's usually what happens today. The message gets watered down. The message gets comp uh, compromised so that it might attract people. That's not what Paul did. He uses the Old Testament with the Jews. He could speak the language of the Greeks and, 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 and the Jews. He could speak Hebrew and probably Latin. Um, he was familiar with the Greek and the Roman cultures and, and the Jewish culture as well. And he used all of that in order to help him reach all these different kinds of people. But as much as Paul adapted himself to people, he didn't change the gospel. N and neither did he allow the culture to define the gospel or to change it. And we're going to see that come up in chapter 14. Um, the message of the cross was foolishness, he said. The message of the cross was weakness to people. It's the opposite of what they might have expected. And that he never changes. And maybe in part, that's why it's important not to be offensive to unbelievers. Paul had the most offensive message in the world to bring. And he didn't want to add himself to the offense. Okay, that takes us to uh, verse 24 uh, and following. 
Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Some of the imagery that Paul uses in this um, section here comes from the Isthmian Games. Um, the Isthmian Games were held at Isthmus, uh, which is 10 miles uh, east of Corinth. So the people in Corinth would have been very familiar with this. The, uh, the town there, Isthmus, was uh, named after the Isthmus that connected the mainland of, of Greece to the peninsula that Corinth was on. Um, these were kind of Olympic-like games. They were held in the spring every other year, kind of like the the uh, here in California, the Transpac sails to Hawaii on the odd years, the Pacific Cup sails to the uh, to Hawaii on the even-numbered years. And Paul uses uh, an example of a runner in in these Isthmian games to uh, show the importance of effort and self-discipline in the Christian life. Um, a life he's calling the, Christ, the, the Corinthians to, a life that he has lived by example. Now, a little bit about these Isthmian games. Um, uh, the games were held in, the, in honor of the, god, the Greek god Poseidon. Um, this is the earthquake-shaking god of the sea. Um, the Roman counterpart is Neptune. Um, and the most prominent buildings in Isthmia uh, was a temple that was dedicated to Poseidon. Uh, there was a stadium there. There was a theater there. There was a hippodrome. Uh, hippos means horse and drome means course. There was a, a horse track there. And there was also a building that was dedicated to where the athletes swore an oath of fairness. And if they broke that oath, they would be disqualified, which kind of ties to that, that uh, verse 27 where Paul says, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. A big building there dedicated to oaths and disqualification. And so Paul talks about it. Um, uh, events in this, these Isthmian games, they had foot races, they had wrestling, boxing, throwing discus and javelin, long jump, chariot racing, and poetry, reading, and singing. So you could be considered an athlete if you write poetry um, or if you sing. Um, and according to several uh, inscriptions that are contemporary to Paul's day, women competed in these games as well. Um, there's an inscription about a, mentioning a woman who won the 200-meter dash as well as the war chariot races. Okay. Um, now, there were no permanent... Uh, uh, accommodations at this site. Um, people stayed in tents uh, in the surrounding area. And so fixing or selling tents uh, would have given Paul, who was a tent maker and one who repaired tents, um, ample employment. And it would have given him also an opportunity to share the gospel uh, with those who are attending the games. And so, uh, so uh, Paul's probably very familiar with the games that are being played here at, at Isthmus. Now, obviously, when athletes uh, prepare for an event, they spend their life training. They give up a lot of good things in order to reach their goal. They have to exercise great self-control, all to win. In the case of the Isthmian games, what they would win is a wreath of withered celery, uh, along with, of course, some personal honor and, and glory. Um, but that's all you get at the Isthmian Games, uh, not gold or silver like you do the, at the Olympics. And like in the America's Cup, uh, there is no second place. There was one wreath, one winner, and no consolation prizes. And Paul applies that kind of thing to himself here. He says, I don't run aimlessly. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm going to run toward the goal in order to receive the prize. Um, he says... As, an, uh, 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 as, as a boxer accomplishes nothing by boxing the air, kind of a shadow boxing idea, um, he was not going to waste his energy on things that didn't further the gospel. 
Um, Paul had the right to many things that he didn't insist on. Um, some of those things would have made his life easier. Some of those things would have made his life better. But he was willing to be beaten. He was willing to be uh, uh, taken prisoner for the cause of the gospel. He willingly gave his body, as he tells the Romans, as a living sacrifice. Um, had he not stayed disciplined, um, he felt that he ran the risk of disqualifying himself from winning the prize. Um, if he lived a life of self-indulgence, he feared that he would endanger not only the salvation of other people, but maybe even himself. And the danger of disqualification was real. Disqualification would result in nothing less than missing out, not on some withered uh, celery wreath, but on the crown of life. And what a tragedy it would be if, after preaching the gospel to others, he would no longer be found in the faith. Paul had devoted his life to commending the blessings and the benefits of the gospel to other people, and Paul wanted to share in that himself. And so the implications of all of this uh, are obvious to the Corinthians. It would be a great tragedy if you, Corinthians, forfeited your salvation because you ceased to exercise self-control and relapsed into idolatry. And that's where Paul is going to take us in chapter 10. The Lord be with you.